I'm pressing live now. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're launching a crowdfunding campaign for Cabinets HR starting March 2nd. So please go to HTTPS cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding to donate and share with your friends. Our guest today is Rafael Eliasson. Rafael, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be great every day, Jason. Thanks for having me. Rafael is a personal growth and business coach from the north of Norway. As a kid, Rafael could often be found talking to adults about their life problems and what they were doing to improve their lives. Rafael, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So first of all, I have to go, I mean, I, I can imagine like I'm going to, there's a dog, you walk to the, to the dog and say, what's your problem today? Like, how does that even work? Right. Do you get like, get looks like, what's this kid doing? Like is this, this kid better go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's considered pretty weird, but you know, after a while, I also started to get more shy and careful because I realized that was not normal and that was not okay. So it kind of conditioned me to, to calm down a little bit, but there was that seed that I wanted to, you know, to be a coach and help people. I think from a really, really young age, it's quite funny. Do you find that adults are actually more open to you? Cause like, you know, most adults, they don't want to like tell their problems to other adults and they're like, okay, here's this kid. He's not going to repeat what I say to me, be all the way open with this kid. Yeah. What? Yeah. I think, I think they were, um, <laughs> they were entertaining me, you know, they were like, oh, okay, let's see where this goes. <laughs> so it's pretty funny that I think most people see it as less threatening, you know, talking about their problems to a kid. Did you, you might not know this, but why they put their walls down. You might know this, but do you know what percentage actually took your advice? Like, man, this kid makes sense. Let me, let me do this. <laughs> let me do this I'm not going to no tell idea. no one that keep giving me advice, but I'm going to do what this kid said. Uh, I wish I knew. I wish I, I wish I knew all the ones. Yeah, I was, su I was such a little kid that there's no way I could remember, but if I could, I'd go back and talk to every one of them and see if they implemented. Cause what I realized was people tend to take advice more that they pay for anyway. So mm -hmm. over the years of being a coach, I've realized that probably most of that advice that I gave away wasn't taking uh, too hard or too seriously. So that's a good point. Can you talk about this a little bit? Cause like, um, like you said, you know, if you give free advice, no one takes it. If you pay, you know, just like if you go like back in the day, if you used to go to like a nightclub, it was free. No one would go to the nightclub cause it's free, right? If you charge $20, people want to go in. Right. And it seemed, it seemed like kind of tutor, like, like, why do you pay for advice you get for free? Can you talk about that dynamic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I used to watch free YouTube videos every day. Uh, about personal development and self-help. And my life was a mess. I, I remember I was very depressed. You know, nothing was working. I was a broke janitor. And yet I was watching lots of content that could theoretically help me change my life, right? Lots of Tony Robbins speeches and all that good stuff. Yeah, I was listening, watching and reading everything. But it wasn't until I invested in a coaching program and got like real consulting that showed me, oh, here's how you do it. This is the next step. This is what you need to do now. And let me hold you accountable to that. And then my life started changing. I went from, you know, struggling as a janitor, making minimum wage to running a six figure business pretty much within like a six month uh, transition period. So it happened really quickly because when I paid for it and I had skin in the game, I took it seriously and I listened to everything and I implemented it week by week. And there was a better structure to it because when you're just, you know, free is always messy. That's usually what comes with free. It's kind of all over the place. It's good and it's nice and it can be motivating, but it doesn't usually get great results. Can you talk about why so many people don't invest in themselves? Because I think LeBron James famously spends like a million dollars on health and stuff. You eat your own self, of course. Most people can't invest a million dollars. But why do so many people not invest in themselves? I think it's really easy to feel bad asking for help, right? I think there's a stigma around, oh, if I need help, then there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And yeah, my character is, is flawed on a level that is so deep that it doesn't even matter if I try to fix it. And I think when we do get help, it's not something that we're proud of. We don't shout to the world, oh, I have a coach. As some people do nowadays. But especially when I started, that was weird. Like, oh, you have a coach? What's wrong with you? What's going on? Oh, you have a therapist? That's crazy. What, there must be something really, really bad going on in your head. Not necessarily, right? If you want to progress and grow and improve your life, you would want to ask for help. But I guess there's just still quite a bit of stigma and, and weird mindsets going about it. So a lot of it's per thinking it's personal pride. Yeah, for sure. And I think a big part of it too is, you know, the fear of what if this doesn't work? Well, what if you don't even try? That's way worse. If you don't get any help, then for sure, you know, that's pretty much a guarantee you're going to stay the way that you are. If you don't change your input, how's your output going to change? Your results can't change just from thin air. You have to do something different. And if you don't know any better and you have nobody telling you, hey, this is what needs to happen, it's pretty hard to shift. 
So Raphael, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there now, like you no know, personal trainers, business coaches, et cetera, et cetera. How do you recommend someone finding the coach that's right for them? My favorite way is the free content. I think that's what it's there for. It's to, you know, give you a taste of what it might be like to talk to the person or work with them or, you know, buy their products. I love that because it's a free open market. Everybody can put out, you know, all their free content. And if it resonates, then they'll probably make more and more people will be drawn in and watch more. And then that will lead to sales down the line of the business. So, yeah, I really think just look at what you resonate with for free. And if you like it, then usually they have some sort of paid offer to, to sell you, you know, once you're ready to step up and take it seriously and really start implementing and getting support. Well, coach, is there any like, kind of like, if you're a county, you, got, you, just, you get a CPA, lawyer, go to you know, law school. Is there any like certification for coaches? I think it was called the International Coaching Federation, I think is out there. Is there anything like, like the, that coaches apart from other ones? Sure. I think the best ones are the ones that have results and they lead with their results, not with their certifications. I think there's lots of great certification programs out there, uh, but I don't necessarily believe in them like I believe in people. And what I care about most is really just, okay, can you get me to where I want to be? Have you taken other people there already? Do you have a proven track record? And if they don't, then obviously they should be charging far less you know, probably just getting their first few clients, maybe even do some work for free to get at least a little bit of a name and the brand built for themselves and then maybe some referrals. But yeah, with people that are good at what they do, I think it, it's really glaringly obvious. It's not something that you have to do a ton of digging to find out. It's usually right there, right in front of our eyes. So Rafi, if you're like a brand new coach, right? Let me backtrack. Suppose someone's out there that has some lack of experience in a certain skill set and they, they want to be a coach. They've never, never done it before. Like, how do they get started, right? Because I imagine, like, if I say I'm Jason Cavan, is financial coach, I, I'm going to get no customers, right? How do you get that, get across that barrier? The first most important thing is knowing who you're serving uh, down to the T, you know, and I, I like to go into psychographics, not just demographics. A lot of people go, okay, ideal client avatar, here's what they look like, here's where they live, here's the language they speak. But what I think is way more valuable is, what are they thinking about? You know, what thoughts are they having every day? What are the biggest things that stress them out? And that's what I would start listing out is, okay, what challenges are they facing? What keeps them up at night? And then you want to make a list of, okay, where do those people hang out already? Where are they getting their problems solved? If at all, right now, who else do they follow? Who already has that list? And then can I collaborate with those people? Can I run ads targeting people who follow those pages, right? So there's a lot of creative ways to position yourself, whether it's you know being a guest on a podcast or starting a YouTube channel and trying to rank for certain keywords and terms, or if you're doing a Facebook group, there's a million ways to market. They all work if we make them work, right? It's easy to say, oh, Facebook ads don't work. I used to say that. I remember when I first <laughs> tried them. Facebook ads don't work. Yeah, of course they don't work for me because I'm doing it wrong. And then I fixed it and all of a sudden 5X, 10X ROIs weren't that crazy. And it's really just because there was something wrong with me. So we have to go, okay, who do we want to help? How do we show up in a way that genuinely attracts them and wants them, uh, sorry, makes them want to actually work with me? How do I get them to raise their hand and go, hey, please, please help me. I want to work with you. I like the sound of this. So Raphael, how do you know if someone actually wants to work with you? Like, I mean, of course, if someone pays the money, but how do you tell they're really all in or, or this like check the black, so to speak? I think time commitment really being willing to implement. That's the most important thing. Like if I say something and they just do it instead of, you know, overthinking it, getting stuck in their mind about why this might not work. I've been guilty of this too. When I've paid for coaching where I start questioning the person's methodology and going, oh, there's something wrong with this method. I don't like the way that we're doing this. And all of that is just nonsense because if you really trust somebody and you're going to, you know, give it a real shot, you have to do what they say and actually try it and see if it works before you start judging and you know getting in your own way mentally so i think when they're really just implementing and taking one step at a time uh, that's that's the best way to tell obviously when they're invested financially it makes that a lot easier too how long should someone stay with a coach before they move on to another coach or like change coaching methods in my opinion and this is you know personal opinion really so I, everybody has their two cents on this but for me three to six months on average I think that some clients would decide to work with you for way longer. I have had clients who worked with me for over five years. Amazing. Not because they need me though. And that's, I think, the big thing that distinguishes here. If you still need the coach three to six months into the program, or definitely after a year of the, after the program, then there's something wrong. Uh, it means you haven't really solved the issues, right? You should be able to then 
go to the next step, take, uh, take things to the next level yourself or get a new coach and a new program and things like that. So I think you should always be learning from new sources and upgrading in different aspects. For example, who helped me with Facebook ads is not the same person that got my personal psychology dialed in, right? There are experts in different fields, but at the same time, you will have some clients that just love working with you, of course, and they want to stay just because, you know, it's, it's a powerful professional relationship. The results are great. They don't really mind either the payments or whatever. At that point, it's just so powerful of a connection and you keep getting results together. And it's just such a great fit for a long-term uh, format of working together. But I think those are rare. And if it's more than one in 10, then I, th I think it's getting a little bit suspicious. So that's how I think about it. So out of three months or six months, Mark, is, is the responsibility of the client or the coach to, in, in the relationship, so to speak? Well, I yeah, I think... I think to a certain level, both, but in my experience, if the coach doesn't and just keeps offering more and more and more, a lot of clients will just kind of string along because they think, okay, at the end of the tunnel, right? If I just keep investing, eventually it'll all be worth it. And there's something known as, you know, sunk investment cost, and it's a fallacy where we think because we put this much in, we better keep going because what if it doesn't pay off and the payoff is all the way at the end. So they string somebody for, you know, a year or something like that just to make more money, not for the results or for the client to be happy. So yeah, I think you really have to be careful as a, as a consumer, as somebody who buys coaching to watch out for that. With your clients, how do you manage expectation? Like suppose a client signs with you and they think, oh, I'm gonna sign with Raphael in three months, I'm gonna be, you know, Superman or Superwoman or make a million dollars or something, you know, extraordinary is gonna happen. How do you manage expectations? Yeah, so I really go based off of where somebody is at. You know, I worked with people who do eight figures a year and it's great. But if you're starting at, you know, you're, you have a salary that's two or three or four or $5,000 a month, and you think that you're going to start making a million a year from month three, yeah, that's pretty unreasonable. So it really depends on where someone is. I think that's a big part of the answer. And the other part for me that really helps to distinguish, okay, you know, how do I really, how do I really make it clear to you how far we can get in that amount of time is by looking at, okay, what's your input, right? So we can get really clear on what exactly are you going to do and spend your time on to expect this kind of result? Because, you know, it's very logical, actually. We make this emotional. It's, you know, oh, it doesn't feel right. Do I feel like I'm making progress? But if you just look at what you have to do to get what you want, and you have a very clear bridge between those two, then it's obvious. So if you're sending out one email, one cold email a week to try to attract customers, we're in trouble. You know, we're not going to get many. But if you're running ads for 3K uh, a month, pretty good chance you'll, you know, you'll book a few hundred calls if you're doing that or if you're selling a program right away, whatever it might be. So yeah, just really looking at what are we doing to generate those results? Is this reasonable to ask of you? Is it reasonable for you to talk to 30 new people a day or is that way too much? You can only do one or two or three. So depends on that. Raphael, is anyone uncomfortable? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but usually those people don't reach out. That's the beauty of it, right? I think people disqualify themselves to a certain extent. Very rarely have I gotten on a call or talked to a person who just doesn't want the help. Why would you reach out in the first place? It makes no sense. So Raphael, like pre-COVID, you know, there would be like, you know, conventions for software tech people, conventions for industry salesmen. Do coaches have like conventions and get togethers? Y'all get together and like compare notes or anything like that? Or how does that work? Sure. Yeah. We have uh, a lot of masterminds, a very high ticket masterminds that we pay for and we're a part of. I think that's a big part of the, the industry. And then you have some virtual events and live events as well. Of course, just like any other industry, I think it's pretty similar in that aspect. Who, who are some coaches that you follow? Uh, one that you? I learned a, yeah, sure. So one that I learned a lot from in terms of systems and processes and just streamlining my business and everything like that was uh, Sam Owens, which owns consulting.com. So he's a really great resource, especially he has a great program for beginners, but he has some stuff at intermediate level and also advanced. So that's one, but I, I've worked with a lot, a lot of different ones throughout the years. So Raphael, can you go more to you and exactly what type of coaching, coaching you do? Absolutely. So the first part of what I do is really inner work. It's getting the person in the space where mentally they're aligned with their goals. 
uh, getting rid of trauma and any weird resistance that is in their head that might be holding them back from actually getting what they want. A lot of the time we think, okay, if I just do the tactics like Facebook ad, or let me do organic outreach or build a group or start a channel, whatever it might be, that's not usually the problem or what holds us back. Usually there's something mentally or some type of internal, either, you know, you feel like you can't really speak the way that you want to, or when you try to market and attract customers, it feels weird. There's something off internally. So we make sure that's aligned first of all. And we do that work through, you know, shifting beliefs, uh, really redesigning beliefs and the mindset entirely, uh, working through emotional trauma and processing any kind of weird pent up feelings around making money or doing better or growth or attracting customers, anything like that. And then we get to the technical stuff. So we do that so that we have a real foundation and a platform to work off of. Because the biggest mistake is, all right, I want to do, you know, 100K a year, 200, 300K a year. And I have all the stuff that's unresolved that's actually dragging me and holding me back. It would be like climbing a mountain with a backpack filled with a ton of rocks. You're just making the journey way harder than it needs to be. So we fix that first. And then once we're done with that, then we get to all the technical stuff, the psychographics of the ideal customer, then we get into, okay, exactly where should I be marketing to them? How do I attract them? You know, how do I really sell out my program and, and my offer so that, you know, I have more customers than I can handle. And that's all about obviously using a, a mix of organic and also paid advertising to really grow and scale the business. So talking about marketing a little bit, and you talked about it a little bit already, how do you find your customers? Is many word of mouth, the Facebook ads, like how do you, how do you go about doing that? So I use diversified traffic. For a lot of beginners, it only makes sense to use one platform because they don't have a team. They're just starting out. You know, they're very early and, and it would be very expensive and a ton of overhead to try to run multiple platforms all at once. And also just their attention is scattered. They don't even master one. So in the beginning, I just recommend start with one platform, right? If you think your customers hang out on Facebook the most, great, build a group or focus on, you know, dialing in Facebook ads. Don't try to also do every other platform. But for me, you know, I've had a YouTube channel for seven years now. So that's my longest running platform where I started my whole first year. I only focused on that. Then I started adding in other platforms like Facebook. I had a group. Um, I co-owned the group with a friend. Now we've started a new one as well. And uh, another thing that I do is obviously podcast interviews, but I have my own podcast too. I also have Instagram. So we have a lot now. But it's not just me, right? If it's me on my own trying to manage all these platforms, run all this stuff, I would go crazy. And I also don't post nearly as much as what most like high-level influencers. So I don't think it's about, you know, be posting three, four, five, 50 times a day. You should try to build systems and a team so that you can kind of step out and not be busy, busy, busy all the time running your business, sort of like a slave to your, to your own business. That's not the kind of business you want to build. Usually you want something that fulfills you and makes you happy. So that's been my approach and it's worked really well. well. What's your favorite social media platform right now? Well, TikTok for, you know, getting traffic because it's just exploding. And, you know, the first TikTok we made got 5 million views. That's pretty funny how crazy well that works if you just play to the platform. But in terms of actual personal favorites, I still have a really big soft spot for YouTube because okay. it's where I started my whole journey. I did daily videos every day for a whole year. And it changed my life on a personal level, not just professionally. My business obviously has grown a ton from it, but <laughs> the fact that you know I got to evolve and become a better speaker and really just learn how to communicate my message, that's thanks to YouTube's existence. So I'm really grateful for it. Well, I feel from your perspective, are people more scared of failure or are they, are they more scared of success? It's a really good question and it's a tough one. <laughs> I think most of us are running away from something. So when we're trying to get to success, it's because, you know, if we want to make a lot of money, it's because we don't want to be poor. And, you know, if we want a lot of clients and customers, it's because we don't want to not have any and know that we're bad at what we do and people don't want to work with us. So I think most people are fear driven. And I used to be as well, quite honestly. But a big shift that I made was using inspiration as the fuel source instead of desperation. So it's really going from a mindset of, <clears throat> okay, I need to do this because if not, I'm not good enough or I'm somehow lacking to I'm doing this because I care and it's genuine and I'm passionate about it. And that switch from, oh, let's go and make money so that I'll be okay to let's make money because then I can serve more people. I can amplify my message. I can have a greater reach. I think that's massive. That's 
you know, such a big difference in quality of life and just day-to-day happiness. So Raphael, this next one is this a very broad, very, very question, very, very question. But can you tell us something about Norway? Of course. <laughs> yeah, I live in the north. So the south of Norway is a different experience. Uh, but I live in the north. I like to go skiing every week in the winter. In the summer, we have the sun up all night. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> if anybody gets a chance to visit, take it. It's it's amazing. There's a good reason for why I've you know decided to settle here and, and live here. Obviously, I travel when it's not COVID and crazy, but yeah, it's just a it's just a beautiful country. It's really amazing. Hey, are, you, are you were you born and raised there? Yeah, so I was originally born in Russia, but okay. I was raised in you know my whole childhood was in Norway. Okay. Next, can you talk some about your about your social anxiety and depression you've had? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that it, it played a huge part in my life. Really, when I was, you know, in my teens, especially, I just felt that I didn't have any control. I felt like my life was sort of just uh, on accident mode. So things would just happen and I would kind of wish for things to be better. But I didn't really feel like what I thought even mattered. I felt powerless, you know, and that led to a lot of apathy. And that led to just giving up. And when you give up, you stop trying, which takes you further down the cycle. So I became obese. I developed really intense social anxiety. I struggled to talk to people. And, you know, this whole journey of, of building the business and, you know, <laughs> originally the intention was just to improve myself. It all came from one night where it snapped. And I was like, enough is enough. And I think this is really powerful that when you're in apathy, a big step up is anger. Right? When you've given up, just getting angry at like, oh, enough is enough. I don't want to be like this anymore. That was life changing for me. Um, I remember I would play video games for about 16 hours a day. So pretty intense. And there was that one night where I just snapped the disc through the controller, said, that's it. Enough is enough. I'm going to change my life. So with depression, I mean, there's like, there's, there's antidepressants, there's therapy. Is there any certain way? I'm guessing each person is different, right? Some people be beyond medicine, some people do therapy. Like, how does a person figure out what's right for them, right? Without, you know, having extra pain, I guess. Yeah, I think that for me, um, I did take antidepressants for a while. Um, they were not the most helpful in my personal experience, not telling anybody else what to do here. But therapy was very helpful. And coaching was also really, really helpful. So both of those two for me talking to somebody who really knew what they were talking about. Uh, yeah, it makes a big difference, right? Getting real help, it can be life-changing. So I think the best thing to do, find somebody who, who you think can really, really help you and, and work with them and chances are it'll go pretty well. Yeah, I remember one time uh, seeing like an ad for the inside press on TV of like, blah, 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 side effects may cause more severe depression, more severe depression. Like what, wait, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Wait, what were you just say? So you caused the problem, you fixed. That's uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I think the biggest thing is like having people you can trust with, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't have that person they can trust, right? Or at least they don't yeah, think they have a person they can trust. I think you have to switch your mindset to actively look. That's what happened to me. So before I was in victim mode, everything's happening to me, and then I went, okay, if I don't find somebody to help me with this, then it's my fault that I'm stuck because I didn't even really try or look, right? So if you don't have that person, keep looking and, and you will find them. I mean, they're out there. Like there's, there's plenty of great people who can help, uh, but it's just going out of your way to connect with them. So with depression, is depression something that you say, I'm depressed, or does like a doctor or something have to say you're depressed? How does that work? Well, I think that's a really loaded question. And I'll be careful, you know, <laughs> diving too deep and giving my opinion, but and from from my perspective, it's it's probably like most things, not an either or, but a little mm -hmm. bit of both. I think most people that have depression are, are sort of aware of it themselves, and then they tend to get it confirmed by somebody. To a certain degree, could there be a level of a self fulfilling prophecy going on? To is there you know things that you could do to shift your mindset and get out of that space? Yes, but I think without help and without real support, it's sort of like if somebody's drowning and you're telling them that, hey, you know, what would be great is if you don't drown, then you should probably like swim and not, and not drown, right? That would be nice. No, but that doesn't work because I'm drowning. So I need somebody to pull me out. Um, so 
best you could really do is scream for help, you know, try to make as much noise as possible to get noticed. And hopefully somebody comes in and, and helps you out of there. At least that's what I did. So that's been my experience. I'm sure plenty of people have uh, opposing or different views, but that's been me. Yeah. I think that's the stereotype out there. If you're depressed, like you're sad, you're lonely, you can really tell, but it usually like, you know, happy people depressed too. Like the most famous case, Robert Williams, right? Big comedian, always happy. And, you know, you know, he committed suicide for depression, unfortunately, right? And it like shocked, it shocked everyone, right? I just want to you look at someone and say if how they're feeling inside, right? Yeah, that's uh, pretty much impossible. You know, nobody can really read your mind. Sometimes, you know, people uh, kind of show it, even unintentionally. So it's always nice if somebody can spot that and, and make a difference in somebody's life. But it's difficult to do. It's very, very difficult to do yeah. when somebody keeps it hidden. And, and you know, it happens all the time. You'll ask someone, hey, how you doing? And they say, I'm fine. And you're like, oh, no, really, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. And, but really, that hurting downside, right? Because no one else wants to share, like you said. Yeah, it's it's very difficult when somebody decides to shut down. And that's why I think we have to promote and, and really advocate for, you know, if you feel anything that, you know, could use a bit of help, just please, like, get the help. So you might not know the answer to this question, but once someone's depressed, I mean, pretty much they they suffer depression the rest of, of their life, right? Or in such or case where you can be depressed and all of a sudden, like, you never depressed again. Sorry, Jason, can you repeat that? So, I, I so what, what's, what's, what's your depressed, right? Are you pretty much going to suffer from depression the rest of your life? Or is it, or, is, or through therapy, you'd say, you, wanna, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm not depressed oh, anymore. Sure. I think you can absolutely work through it. I mean, I, I was diagnosed as clinically depressed, social anxiety like extreme social anxiety, actually. So absolutely, you can work through it. In my experience, it's it's actually really an amazing journey. I think, you know, many people will see it as, oh, depression, that's it, right? That's the end of the road or somehow this horrible thing that you can never get out of. I see it more as a spring, you know, when the spring gets pushed down really, really, really hard for a while after when you let go, it just goes flying. And um, I think a lot of people who go through depression experience that where when they've been at their lowest low, their highest high is not that far away. And then things usually tend to stabilize as well. And uh, yeah, people tend to be a lot more happy and enjoy their life. If you go through that journey and, and you actively work on it and you decide, you know what, I'm going to fight this. I'm not just going to let this be something that controls my life or ruins the rest of my life. And you're proactive. Absolutely. Of course you can. Next, let's talk about your podcast. So, so how long have you been doing it and what's, what's the focus of it on? So the podcast is actually very, you know, the, the same content that we release on YouTube and we started doing it about a year ago or it's, it's more than a year ago now, sorry. Uh, but it's more than a year and we really did it sort of like, Hey, let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, Let's just put it out there. And if anybody resonates with it, we're already making this content. You know, we might as well distribute it in a way that's convenient to people. And a few people were asking for it. So I thought, okay, why not? And we kind of just started uploading it and, and putting it out there. But uh, we never expected what happened. It, it exploded and the traction on it, you know, we got several hundred thousand downloads just coming in very, very fast. And, and uh, yeah, it blew up. And what it's about, it's the same stuff I talk about pretty much everywhere, self-improvement mindset you know, really getting into a space where you feel great about yourself. And then also some of the tactics and steps to take to actually grow a successful business and do really well as an entrepreneur. Do you have guests in your podcast or is mainly you um, giving out content? Some, yeah. So, so far I've brought on clients um, just to talk about their experiences working with me and what they've seen. Uh, we are planning on bringing on guests in the future, uh, but yeah, so far it's mostly just been, it's been clients and myself just sharing my ideas and what I've been going through. So I guess you've had a pretty fun experience to doing it so far. Yeah, it's been amazing. I love it. It's a blast. And how does the YouTube channel compare the, to the podcast? Are you just repurposing content from one channel to another one? Or are there two separate content platforms for you? We re yeah, we, yeah. Full, full disclosure, we repurpose it. So when I'm recording for YouTube, I keep in mind, there's a lot of people who are just going to listen. Um, actually, a lot of the time, you know, the po podcast gets more downloads than YouTube nowadays, even though we have... Um, close to like 90,000 subscribers on YouTube. So yeah, it's done in a way where, you know, the audio listeners kept in mind right from the beginning, yeah. but obviously there's a video format coming out with it too. And how, how did you push out your podcast and, and uh, YouTube? Uh, so on YouTube, a lot of what I did was really just 
optimizing for keyword search terms. For example, if you type in how to stop overthinking, I have a video that ranks really well for that, probably 1.6 million views or something like that. Uh, so yeah, really just looking at what's in demand and what has traction already and leveraging that. And then another big piece of it has been collaborating, working with people who already have an audience and have traction. And then, you know, they promote you and they drive traffic to you and then you grow your audience that way. And you said you have a team helping you do all this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I even have, um, just for me to be on your podcast, uh, I work with an agency that reaches out on my behalf and, you know, finds people that they think I'm a good fit for their podcast. And that's how I come in as a guest. But yeah, everything I do, I try to do leveraged. The, uh, the only thing that I don't leverage is, you know, servicing my clients and getting them great results. And then also really, uh, creating the content itself. That's pretty much yeah, what I do. It, it's probably bad if you outsource your coaching part, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are lots of people who do and they make a lot of money, but personally, I, yeah, I think it's the best experience is working with the person behind the brand, yeah. right? So Raphael, you, you, you're both a coach and an entrepreneur. How do you like keep all those, both of those in balance? Yeah, I mean, my, my business is a consulting business at the end of the day, but it's still a business. So I have to be the CEO of the business and I'm also the main coach. Those are really the only two things I have to balance. And to be quite honest, I don't think that's difficult at all. You know, most business owners, they spend time with their clients regardless, right? Especially small business owners. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's actually that much of a challenge. I just work with clients, get them results and attract more clients through the marketing and get those clients better results and then keep doing that. So pretty natural, actually. From your point of view and from your opinion, should there be a limit or number of clients a coach has? Like example, I'm looking for a coach and I find a coach and I see that coach has like 100 clients, right? Should that be like a red flag to me? Is, is it like the fewer clients the coach has, the better they're going to be? Or is there any rhyme or reason to that? Sure. I think it depends a little bit on the system that they use. So if it's leveraged and, you know, they're outsourcing the work and they're still getting great results and there are, you know, coaches in there for accountability and they have weekly calls, that's more of a program. And I think that's great. So it really just depends on what the result is that you're after at the end of the day. But yeah, in my opinion, if you're trying to find a personal coach that you want to work with one-on-one, -on -one, if they have more than 20, 30 clients, you're asking for <laughs> a lot from one human being, right? It's yeah, that's, that's a lot to keep in mind all at once. So I think really high quality coaching, especially if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the person doesn't have more than like 10 to 20 clients that they're working with at a time. So what's your long-term plan for your coaching business? Do you want like, you know, you know, eventually like have coaches underneath you or do you want to keep it by yourself or what's your plan? Yeah, right now, actually, I have to be honest, you know, I'm not always in expansion mode. I'm very happy with where we are. Uh, I'm not looking to grow it a whole lot every single month or every single year to increase revenue just for the sake of it. You know, we're already a multi six figure business and it's very healthy and pretty much all profit. So things are great. And yeah, I, I'm not planning on outsourcing the coaching or anything like that. If anything, you know, for now, I've still done a lot of the consults myself, but we've been starting to bring people into the team that do the consultations with potential clients as well. So that'd be probably one thing that um, I will have to hand off completely eventually just because of the time and protecting that. So for every one hour you're with a client, how much time do you have to do for prep for that one hour to get ready for it and, and, and give your best self to that person? I actually don't think you have to do much prep at all. I think, you know, from session to session, there should be clarity on exactly what the goals are and accountability there. I think you need probably 10 to 15 minutes to review, but I usually chunk that at the beginning of my day. So I would look through every client's progress and any updates that they send to me and make sure that everybody's on track and doing what they're supposed to do. If I'm having a call with them, then I already know. And that way I'm already dialed in way in advance and I don't have to do it from meeting to meeting. So I'm going to presume you have clients in, in, different country, in different countries across the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Everywhere. Do you find that based on the country's culture or whatever, that you have to like approach, approach that client differently based on the country they're from? I would say in terms of my coaching style and to actually get them results, no, not much at all. Uh, but sometimes we have to adapt to their market more with how they position themselves and what work they do and and how they really do their marketing and everything like that. So yeah, sometimes the approach when it comes to the client and their work but in terms of coaching people, most people that come to me, they like my content, they resonate with what I do. You know, they already know that it's going to be a good fit. So it's very natural and I don't have to adapt or play a certain role just to keep clients happy. And are most of your clients business people? 
yeah, absolutely. Most of them are entrepreneurs. I do work with uh, professionals as well, but most of the clients are running their own businesses. Um, so next, let's talk about when you dropped out of high school. Talk, talk about that story. I think this is pretty interesting. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> I mean, I wish I could say that I knew that it was all going to work out, right? I was going to start a business. It was going to be great. I had no clue. I just hated it so much. I mean, every day was just, I just felt so wrong. Like these people who didn't have a life that I wanted were telling me how to do things and things that they didn't even really know that well and things that I didn't care about. It felt like torture not to bash and to say that my teachers were bad. If, if anything, actually plenty of them were pretty good <laughs> compared to probably what the average teacher is. But uh, it's just, it felt like the wrong system and the wrong approach for, for me from very, very early on. It just, something was off, right? I wasn't learning from somebody who had what I wanted. I was just learning from these people who got this job because they went to a school and got a degree and now they're entitled to teach this stuff. And it made no sense to me. So I realized, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for my own education. I'll work and make money and I'll pay to learn from people who I think are a lot like what I want to, you know, be like. They had the blueprint. They were doing it already. So a lot of people don't know this about me, but I dropped out of high school myself back in the day. So with me, I would skip school all the time during world class, but I would throw up and, and still like get past grade like C's and B's. Like, why am I spending all this time in school? I just like clever take the test right. And originally, like you missed the many days you wanted, you still passed right. So my 10th grade, they passed a the rule. If you missed more than 10 days, you would automatically fail no matter what. So I, I, I missed like 11 days and they said, hey, you're going you're gonna to fail. I'm like, so you already tell me I'm going to fail. You want me to stay in class for nine for every day? I said, no, I'm not doing this. I dropped out. <laughs> but of course, no, I, yeah. I went back the next. It was, it was, it was what's crazy is like, even though I missed a whole semester, I still graduated from high school on time, even though I missed a half a, a half a semester, which is half a year, which is crazy, right? Wow. It's actually a pretty crazy story. Yeah, I think, you know, some people are just not meant to be going through that system. It just doesn't work for them. There's a different path that works way better. Yes. We're after next talking about, I think I started on your LinkedIn or on one of your Instagram posts, where you talk about how to raise your vibration. What does that mean? What is that? Yeah, it's just your level of consciousness and how you're operating mindset wise. So one thing that I struggled with was, yeah, I was, I was telling you about this earlier, actually, Jason, just desperation, right? I need to, I need to get there so that I can be happy. Once I get the clients, then everything will be okay, right? Once I have this amount of views, oh, 1 million views on my YouTube video, that ought to do it, right? That'll tell me that I'm good enough. And it's shifting out from that place of I'll be happy when so called it's called if then living right once I get this thing, then I can be fulfilled and I can be happy. And going from that to really no, I am enough as I am like feeling good in this moment before I do anything, not doing it so that I can feel validated or approved or to get that result and finally feel stimulated, rather just, you know, being present and enjoying every step of the journey. And yeah, that took a lot of inner work for me, but that's what came out of it. That was worth it. Is it easy to tell what someone else's vibration is? Like is it positive, negative, higher, low? Is that something like this natural comes from people? That yeah, you really I, tell? Think, I think it's pretty easy. Yeah, you could look up a uh, scale of consciousness or levels of energy and you can see the dominant emotions and the kind of thought patterns and behaviors that link to them. And you could get a pretty good idea of where somebody's at. Uh, now, I wouldn't go around <laughs> labeling people and say, well, that person's in apathy, clearly, right? That could just be a moment. Uh, but you can, if you spend time around somebody regularly, like let's say you're with them an hour a day for a week, well, you're going to, yeah, you're going to start to see, get a pretty good sense of where they're at. And if you live with somebody for a year, well, you're going to definitely know where they resonate and where they stand most of the time. So yeah, when I was, when I was, in, when, I was in, when I was in the army, I, I took up a new job, right? And the, for the first two weeks out there, the one person that was on vacation, first two weeks, everyone's happy to go lucky. You know, everyone's happy, great going on. This person came back and you could just tell the mood ch it changed like immediately she came. You just, you know, it just felt like, yeah, it was like, it was horrible. Like, yeah, you just, you just feel it in the air when she came back. Yeah, you definitely feel it. Sucks the life out of the room. Yeah. Yes. And when somebody's in a really dark space or in a bad, bad frequency, it just immediately, it has a pretty significant you just, impact. You just feel it. Yeah. So next, talk about how can someone increase their confidence level? Yeah, so the thing that I recommend the most is actually building competence because competence equals confidence. So 
confidence in anything, right? For me, it was make a video every day for one year. I got pretty good at that, you know, because I kept doing it over and over and over again. It's what tends to happen. You master the skill, you know, you feel good. So really the easiest confidence is to build based off of a skill. And then I would work on core confidence as well. And that really comes down to, okay, why am I not confident to begin with? Because there's no reason why you shouldn't just feel good like, as you are, but there's something in there, right? And that's what we have to dig up. So start making a list. And this is quite depressing at first, honestly. So don't do this unless you're already in a pretty good place, uh, but just sit down and like all the reasons why I don't feel good about myself. And it could be, you know, physical attributes. It could be, you know, just things that you went through, bad memories, bad experiences, but you just get a clear overview of, okay, here is why. And now can I work through these? So it starts with acceptance, right? Just being okay with that. This is there. Can you come to terms with this? Am I willing to accept this? That's a good question to ask. If you are, then you can say, okay, cool. Is there any way that this could work to my advantage or in my favor? And a lot of the time there is, and your thoughts will shift drastically if you go through that exercise. I did that myself and yeah, I shifted from, oh God, how am I going to be perceived to, hey, you know what? That's fine. Like I feel pretty good. Calm. So Rafael, you know, I think all of us have some in the past that, you know, traumatized us or we don't do it correctly. And, you know, people always say, well, you know, it's not past, don't worry about it. But, but it's, it's like, how do you do that? How do you like not ignore the past, but like deal with it and like, and, and take the step forward instead of always, always dwelling on it. So three-step process for simplicity, you could go a lot deeper. You could, you know, get treatment like EMDR, which is amazing, really cool form of psychotherapy, very effective. Uh, but three-step process that's simple and anybody can do. Identify, acknowledge, and resolve. So identify is, what is this and where does this come from? Where did this begin? Then, okay, acknowledge. <laughs> Especially a lot of manly men don't do this. They just go, okay, fine. And then they move on, right? A lot of people in general too, they just kind of brush past it. You don't want to do that. You want to acknowledge. When I say acknowledge, I mean, oh, I understand why I felt like this when I was a teenager and I didn't feel secure and people were making fun of me. And now I'm afraid to speak up or public speak or do anything, you know, that's holding me back because of that. Right. It makes sense because I was in this state. This is what I was thinking. I had this experience. Of course, only natural. You see, I'm really acknowledging it. I'm not going, oh yeah, I should just move on. Right. That's kind of the whole thing where uh, <laughs> with food as well, there are kids starving in Africa, so you shouldn't complain about anything ever. And that's, that's crazy. I mean, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to help. Sure, like we should really do our best to make the world a better place for everyone. But at the same time, does somebody else's suffering justify your suffering, even if it's not to the same degree? It makes no sense. So a lot of the time people say, well, just get over it, right? Well, somebody else was maybe abused as a child and they have it far worse than you. What, your teacher made fun of you? No big deal, right? It is a big deal. Because when you're a kid or when you were in that situation, your context was completely different. You didn't see rationally. You just had this one experience through your lens and that's all you saw. So everything that you believe and think has sunk in through that. Now we have to unwind it. And through acceptance and saying, hey, I get why I felt like this. I get why I had these beliefs. We can really start to process it and let go. And then the final step, resolving, that's where we say, okay, what would be a better belief? What do I want to replace this with? So hopefully a study like this has not been done because the study like this has been done is it's, it's a pretty massive study. But it, it would be kind of interesting to see where like they took like a set of kids that all got positive reactions. You know, hey, you're a great kid. You're doing the best you can. You're a superstar. And another set of kids where they just said, you know, you're a loser, you're worthless. And see how, you know, how they, how they, you know, grow up and how they grow in life, right? Hopefully that hasn't been done, you know, hopefully it hasn't been done, but if there's a way to do that without, you know, harming kids, you know, doing something, you know, diabolical, that'd be, I mean, I think we all know the, the kids that you say, give the praise to, they're going to like, I would presume they're going to like do that great in life versus other kids will probably not do so well, I think. Absolutely. You have those uh, examples and stories too, where, you know, a set of twins grew up with the same alcoholic and abusive father. Yeah. One goes on to be super successful. You know these, right? They're mm -hmm. super popular. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Really. And then you have the, the plants, somebody yelling negative things at the plants over and over. And then the other plants positive one plants, nothing. And it's, yeah, it's pretty remarkable what kind of impact it makes. Yeah. I think a lot of parents, 
don't realize the effect that wars have on kids, you know, hey, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of emotional scarring that happens every day. And uh, yeah, it really impacts like our entire society because when you grow up with all these insecurities and all these weird things, they hold you back from, from being the best human being that you could be, which I think is the most important thing, just being a great human, trying to help people and contribute and make a difference, right? I mean, yeah, if, if we can't do that, then it's pretty upsetting. So no, no, everyone, you know, people say, you know, if you have someone toxic in your life, get rid of the toxic person, you know, you know, step away. But what if that toxic person is like your brother, your sister, your mother, or father, or, or, you know, a close, a close friend, like how do you deal with that? Like obviously you just can't, you know, totally cut off your parents, totally. I mean, I guess you can, but you know, how do you work through that? You know? Yeah, I've, I've obviously dealt with this myself too. I think everybody goes through this in their life. And for me, <clears throat> it's really just acceptance again, just starting with like, am I okay with that? The fact that you know, they're like this. Am I okay to deal with this? Because if you're in resentment, that's where everything goes wrong. If you're saying, oh, they shouldn't be like this, what's wrong with them, right? Then that creates this wall and now you can't work through it. But if you go from an angle of trying to understand why are they behaving this way and I care about this person, I want to find out if there's any way that I can help, then that shifts it entirely. So it's just being way more proactive and being a problem solver instead of somebody who just stirs the pot, right? For me in the beginning, when I started my business, I got a lot of disapproval from my parents. I remember that, well, especially most of my mom because you know, she's a uh, Russian and her family are used to more of a traditional route. So basically if you weren't a lawyer or a doctor, then you really messed up, right? Your kid should do that or otherwise they're a failure. So that was the underlying belief. And I would resent that and I would be angry. Like, why doesn't she just understand that I want to do the thing that I want to do with my life? But then I started, an, kind of coming at it from a different perspective. And it was, well, what makes her believe that? Why does she think this way? Why is she bought into that? Okay, how can I possibly make her see otherwise? And you know what I found out that was a really good way to make her see differently was proof, just get results. So when I made my first you know, six figures online running my business and I showed her the money in the bank account, was pretty easy conversation to go, hey, mom, like, this is better than being a doctor. I can really do this. But until then, trying to convince her and show her like, oh, you should just believe in me, right? I have nothing. I have no leverage and nothing to really show for it. So I think a big part of it is work on you, right? If you get yourself dialed in and you're really on top of everything, you have a completely different platform to be uh, impacting somebody else and improving their life or changing the dynamic of a relationship. But when you come from a place of kind of like trying to convince, it's always very difficult. Yeah, you're right. I think a lot of people had to get the mindset like, you know, what worked in my day and age is going to work for the future generation, right? And it's probably not right. Like an example you use, like you used to play video games 16 hours a day. I'm sure back then, you know, people were like, hey, hey, you know, get out, play outside, do this or that. And now, you no know, kids are like they have esports leagues. People make hundreds of thousand dollars playing video games. And I was like, you better get your butt back in the inside of their video game, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's much better advice now. Hey, what what are you doing? Why are you stopping? <laughs> Come on, get back in the game. Yeah, yeah, it changes over time. And if we're not adaptable, then you know we just kind of get left behind. That's the the nature of it. Got to be on the right side of change. Can you talk some of the process of going from being a janitor to where you're at now? Absolutely. I think a big part of it really was internal, right? So I like to think, oh yeah, look at me. My Facebook ads are working or, Hey, look at me. My YouTube videos are getting me clients. I'm great. But really it was just mindset, uh, just feeling the confidence and knowing that, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. And if I don't succeed, I'm going to keep trying it and keep tweaking it until it works. Just continued that for a very long time and kept doing it. And yeah, it really added up. The first six months of daily videos netted me absolutely nothing except for a hundred subscribers. So in six months, I made videos every day. I got nothing. And then I learned, oh, why? What's going on here? There's something I'm doing wrong, but okay, let's look into this. So I got some help and some coaching, of course, as I do always. And it solved the problem for me because it made me really see, oh, I'm not marketing. I'm not attracting customers. I'm just talking about whatever I feel like and uh, expecting people to somehow, you know, want to come work with me. Why on earth would they do that? All I'm doing is just talking a bunch of nonsense and rambling about what I feel that day. <laughs> so what I did is I started making videos that people genuinely were searching for. 
and making content that could really make a difference and impact their life in a positive way. And what do you know? The first video that I made like that, I got my first client. And my first client paid me $160 for weekly coaching calls. And I gave my heart and soul. And he left me after a month. And my heart was broken. It was like my first love or something in the coaching space. So it was, it was bad. I didn't do a great job. Um, and, you know, decent, I would say. It's not like I horribly let him down. He was, he was happy enough, but only for that one month. He wasn't going to continue. And since then, you know, I've had clients who've paid me $30,000 just for a month of coaching. Now, of course, that's a lot of work that we're doing together to pay that kind of money. And the result is outstanding. Nobody would pay $30,000 just for some random coaching. But, and we already had great results from working together before. So full disclaimer on that. But what I'm really trying to say is I went from, you know, minimum wage janitor to, you know, running the business of my dreams and really being fulfilled and happy and having the clients that I always wanted by working on myself. You know, I dialed in my ability to captivate and speak and draw people in. I learned marketing. I took responsibility for every part of it. And that's what netted me results, not, you know, blaming or being upset that something wasn't working. That, that didn't get me very far. I tried it for a bit. I gave up pretty quickly when I realized it wasn't a good approach. Well, can you talk some about, you know, like the, the need to have patience and how long the journey can be? I think a lot of entrepreneurs, where they're, Whatever they're, whatever they're doing, coming to build a lot of people, this is this thing, oh, six months, I'll be Mark Zuckerberg, or two months, I'll be do this, right? It's not easy. Like, can you talk about the need for patience and being really like, you no, know, enjoy the process, so to speak? Yeah, I think there's patience while doing the wrong thing. So make sure the effort you're putting in actually has tangible yield and results at the end of it. Don't just follow any process blindly. That's one mistake that I did. Six months of daily videos could have made progress faster. Um, but at the same time, if you know what your ultimate end goal is, just keep going, like figure new stuff out, keep trying it, get more support, you know, hire somebody, right? <laughs> Again, the thing that people are afraid to do, pay for stuff to really help you elevate and take it to the next level. So my mindset has always been keep digging, you know, don't stop. Don't think, okay, this is the end. So Raphael, I understand you had something for our listeners today. Absolutely. So we do a free consultation uh, for anybody who's interested in working with me. And if the consultation is full, then it'll redirect to our free Facebook group. And then when we do have availability, we announce it there. Uh, and yeah, for people to take advantage of that, just go to eraphael.com and there they can sign up for a free call to see how we can help. And can you, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, it's just Raphael Eliasson on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, like everywhere. So any way they want to reach out, Facebook as well. Uh, feel free to reach out. And to our listeners, we have the link to his gift and his social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. And also a reminder to support our crowdfunding campaign at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Um, is there anything that I should have asked you that I, that I didn't ask you? Uh, no, I, I think we've covered it. I think we've we've gone through a lot of good stuff here. Okay. Uh, so we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I would say um, when you're in this journey and, and you're trying to, you know, find the right technique and the right strategy and, you know, do the right method, just remember that the biggest problem is probably internal and always look at the person that's doing the thing, not the thing, because I was really guilty of this, right? It's the Facebook ads that don't work for my industry or whatever, just blaming again, or YouTube doesn't work. You know, why am I not getting any views? Why am I not getting subscribers, et cetera? There's something wrong with the person, not the method. And I don't mean that as in, oh, you're a flawed character and you can't get better. I mean that as in, you have all the opportunity in the world to get the results that you want if you're willing to do the internal work to shift and think, okay, how am I, the person who's driving this vehicle, actually making this either work or not work. And then if you feel like you need help, you know, get support. That's the biggest thing. I, the biggest mistake I made is just waiting too long, not getting any support, hoping that things would change. Again, wishing for things to be different. You just want to step out of that and, and find people to work with that are really going to help you progress faster. That's the ultimate way to get ahead and uh, to speed things up. So if you want the closest thing to like an overnight success, yeah, just get a ton of coaches and support. That's what all pro athletes do. That's what everybody who's on the high level in any industry. They just have an unfair advantage with how much support they've got going. 
Raphael, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Jason. It was amazing. And to our guests, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.